Do not hurry as you walk with grief. It does not help the journey. Walk slowly, pausing often. Do not hurry as you walk with grief. Be not disturbed by memories that come unbidden. Speak your words and their loved ones will hear you. Unfinished conversations will eventually be resolved. Therefore, be not disturbed. Be gentle with the one who walks with grief. If it is you, be gentle with yourself. Swiftly forgive. Walk slowly. Pausing often. Take time. Be gentle as you walk with grief. Those of you who know me know I don't usually use the past tense. That's why I didn't say it was a wonderful world. It is a wonderful world, even though our hearts are a little heavy right now. But my hope and prayer is by the time you leave here today that you will gain a little knowledge and realize that tears and smiles and laughter, all it can exist in harmony. Sometimes people forget that. And I also hope and pray that you leave here stronger than when you came in, knowing that you didn't leave mom here. You didn't lose your grandmother. We didn't lose our friend, but that she is part of everything that makes this such a wonderful world. That's why it was, it is, and it will continue to be this amazing place that we know. Music has always had a way of touching hearts and I've always said that there is a lyric and a note and a melody for every feeling that we have in our hearts. It's in that vein that we're going to begin today with a fairly famous song that was requested by the family, but one that speaks, I think, to the core of love and relationships. So I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and hear these wonderful words by Josh Groban.
raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me amazing when we stop and look back at our life, how quick sometimes that time has gone. We stop and we look back with love and remembrance of all the people that brought us to this place. And today we really are going to spend some time celebrating the way that Glenna brought so many of you to this time and this place in your life. Whether you're a child, whether you're a grandchild, uh, whether you are a work colleague, whether you help to care for her, uh, each of you have been touched by her spirit in a special way. And again, my hope and prayer is that she continues to raise you up to be the best that each of you are until that time we meet again in that place where there's no pain, no suffering, but only light, peace, and hope. Though we're all wearing purple today in her honor, one or two of you are still uh, wearing green from yesterday. <laughs> Sounds like you had a good time. We hope you did. Um, but there is a Celtic prayer that I did be about, if I can find it real quick. Um, that I, I thought was appropriate uh, to begin our time together. And it's simply entitled, Walking with Grief. And I think it's a good, really, way to kind of start our time. Do not hurry as you walk with grief. It does not help the journey. Walk slowly, pausing often. Do not hurry as you walk with grief. Be not disturbed by memories that come unbidden. Speak your words and their loved ones will hear you. Unfinished conversations will eventually be resolved. Therefore, be not disturbed. Be gentle with the one who walks with grief. If it is you, be gentle with yourself. Swiftly forgive, walk slowly, pausing often, take time, be gentle as you walk with grief. The Irish know what they're doing besides making a good Guinness. As I was debating on what to say today and how to describe this truly remarkable woman. 
I was having a tough time because there is so much. Because you see, she was my friend too. Although, as I, I told her daughters, it was quite interesting uh, when she first came to the funeral home to plan for this eventuality. I had to kind of break her down in that stoic Canadian... Victorian Reserve. The Victorian Reserve, yes, thank you. That was what you had come up with, which I, I agree with wholeheartedly. I had to break that down in a way that made her realize that I was still a respectful guy. And I said, there's, no, there's nobody here at the funeral home. It's just us. We don't even have any, any people who have passed away. So we can be a little, you know. And I finally broke her, and she laughed. And we had a good time. And then over the years, I, I got to see her at, at many occasions, obviously many involving her daughter, Bonnie. Um, and then as I would sit and laugh and talk with her, I got to hear about all of you guys, what you were doing, what was going on, the grandkids. She was so proud of where she came from and what she had accomplished. And so that's why when you all walked into this room, I started with that beautiful Scrabble board, and I know some of you who are watching uh, remotely can't see it. You'll see it in pictures later. But those words, joy, together, brave, family, memory, hope, love, along with crocheting and fishing and golf, can't forget those. But one more knit. Lena had a keen way of not just making awesome mittens and gloves, as you see on that little ice skating ballerina there, but she knit people together. She knew how to knit all the unique fabric swaths that make up all of us, and she knew how to bring us together. Which, as you walked up the room, you see this beautiful map. And the thing that amazed me the most is that a female, a woman, a lady with a capital L of her generation could be taken and put in a country where she didn't speak the language. She didn't know the culture. That was long before you could pull out one of these and Google it. <laughs> and she not only survived, but she thrived. And she did it with five hooligans. <laughs> Not really hooligans, but you know. We gave her a run for her money. You gave her a run for her money. Imagine being a mom of five young children in a country where you don't speak the language, you don't understand the culture or traditions, you're thousands and thousands of miles away from anybody that you know that cares for you. You can't just pick up a phone and text them or call them. Par avion, you wrote it airmail and you sent it, and you're lucky if they got it. And all the challenges that come with essentially being a single mom in many ways because dad was always traveling to do right by you guys, so he worked hard. We're not saying that. But she really had to be a single mom in many ways. If that doesn't show strength, tenacity and the ability to knit all of these pieces together, I don't know what does. So I don't need to stand here and tell you all the little things that she loved, like this beautiful creme brulee, which I coughed on so no one else can have and I have to <laughs> suffer with it later. Because you get it. But it wasn't about the creme brulee. It was about sitting down with her grandkids and eating it together. It wasn't about that cup of tea or that cup of coffee. It was her nurses and the aides at Independence Manor who would sneak over at night and just sit with her and have that cup of tea. Yeah, I heard about that. 
because it touched her heart and she then shared it. It's all the little things that really at the end of the day, at the end of the equation, are the big things. They're the things that matter. The old joke, and those of you who know me know I say it often, you can't hitch the U-Haul to the back of the hearse. You're not taking it with you. What we take and what we keep and what we cherish are the same things that we share right now. It's the joy. It's the together. It's the memory. It's the love. It's the hope. It's the brave, strong soul that was and is. And if you don't think it matters, Shel Silverstein, something that I know she gave her grandkids. You're all smiling. And I said that you got to, you can't see it, folks, from the back. But all the grandkids just went whoop. Although I cannot see your face as you flip these poems a while, somewhere from some far off place, I hear you laughing and I smile. I gotta believe she's in that place. She's smiling. She's with us. She's giving all of us strength. She's telling me I'm going on too long. So again, it's not my place to stand up here and say she loved golf. Well, she did. She loved deep sea fishing. She did. But it's to drive home what mattered to her most in life, which was knitting and weaving this fabric of love and family and togetherness. And if you all want to honor her the way you say you do, you have an obligation to walk out of here being a true living memorial and living legacy by taking those values and making them your own. Because see, she would, and she has, because I saw it, she would want each of you to be yourself. She wouldn't want you to fall into something that you weren't. But she would want you to put those gifts out into the world. And if you can be yourself, and if you can take all those other gifts, man, this world would be a pretty, pretty good place, right? It would be the place that we all dream and hope and that Glenna knew it could and really is when we dull down the noise. So again, my hope and prayer is that you walk out of here by being the best versions of yourselves, living life the way she did, and always remembering that she hears you laughing and she's smiling. We're going to give everybody a chance, if they wish, to come forward and share a thought or memory. And I always tell folks, if you don't have something prepared, that's okay. Sharing from the heart is fine. Obviously, we would like to remind everybody that there is a luncheon after this, and you're all welcome to uh, share a lot of the memories there. But if there is something that you know takes a minute or two and really um, has just touched your heart and, and you want to share, we would love for you to do that. I would ask that you come forward. Uh, that way the microphones can pick you up for those who are listening uh, all over the world. And just introduce yourself. Tell everybody how uh, you knew Glenna or how you know a member of the family. And then just speak for your heart. Uh, we do have a few people who have some prepared remarks. And we're going to kind of alternate uh, through. I have been um, honored to be asked to... Uh, read uh, a note that was sent uh, to the children from uh, Cleo McWater. She was a, a longtime friend, probably um, the oldest person, the longest person who knew mom from since kindergarten. And I believe she's watching now as well. Uh, I've heard a lot about you, uh, and I am honored to do uh, to read your words and um, I, I hope I do them justice, and, and please know that uh, we spoke beforehand, and uh, your love was very much present throughout our time here today. So again, this is from essentially Aunt Cleo. 
Um, and it says, to Bonnie, Linda, Joan, and Jamie. I just read the full obituary, and I would like to make a comment. Your mom and I grew up together across the street from each other on Stone Street in Elmvale, Ontario. Any photos you have of us as children were taken there. We were inseparable as children. We played together and went to school together. We skated and skied and roller skated together. We climbed over huge blocks of ice covered in sawdust in the ice house. We swung on swings my father built, and we spent holidays together in the summer. Our parents both owned stores. Your grandparents owned a grocery store, and my parents owned a five to dollar store two doors away. Can you picture it, right? I can see it too. I went to boarding school in Toronto in 1948, and the next year your grandparents sold their store and went to Halliburton where they had cottages. I'm not sure how long they lived there. We lost touch for a few years, but when I was a second year nursing student, your mom came to the residence and she told me she was going to be married and going to live in New Jersey. <laughs> she had come to Toronto to obtain her passport. We kept in touch over the years, and when we did see each other, we took up right where we left off. My first husband, Louis Hodgson, and I visited your family in 1966 in Mexico City. There were only three of you at that point. When Bud and I started spending winters in Florida, we included a visit with your mom and dad every year. We would get caught up and usually saw Linda and James as well. Your mother loved all five of you. She had a special place in her heart for each of you. She was very proud of you and your accomplishments. Her grandchildren were her pride and joy. Please give me an update once in a while. May she rest in peace. Love to you all, Cleo. Could you not see that tapestry being weaved through her letter? Again, I want to now open this up to anybody who wishes to speak from the heart. Yeah, come on up. Quick story. Sure. So I'm, I'm Joan. I'm her daughter. Um, I just remembered this story this morning, and I was reminding Linda about it. Um, anyone... Most people who met my mother initially, she always presented that uh, prim and proper, reserved, oh so polite, considerate demeanor. Um, and, <laughs> and that is how she behaved most of the time. Um, so a lot of times, I think people that didn't know her real well um, didn't know that she did kind of have a spunky side to her. Um, she had uh, gotten a job when Jamie and I were in high school. She got a job at a, our rival high school, Voorhees, um, as a teacher's aide, and she was working with the problem kids, the, the kids that had emotional problems, behavioral problems, etc. And um, so I think uh, something of being around these kids rubbed off on her a little bit because uh, one night we were playing categories and for those of you who don't know this is a game where there's a list of categories on a card and then you roll the dice and then you have to come up and the dice has letters on it so you have to come up with something that fits the category that starts with that letter so we were playing and my husband was there, Linda was there, I was there. I don't remember who else was also playing with us, but the category was musical group. And Linda said ABBA, the letter A. It was musical group letter A. Linda said ABBA, I said the Archies, and mom said anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just, Something I remembered this morning that I thought I'd share is kind of the <laughs> the two sides of mom. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. <laughs> Would anyone else like to share? I can answer that story. 
sure. Come on up. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jim. Uh, um, I'm her son. And to, to the point of my sister, with the last story with the music, I remember this that struck this chord because one day my mother came up to my room when I was living above the garage and I was known for playing music at very loud volumes. And she came up one day and she asked me, she says, she says, Jamie, she says, do you have any anthrax? Meaning the oh. musical band of the anthrax. <laughs> and I said, yeah, why? I said, mom, I said, that's a, it's a heavy metal band. I said, this isn't classical or, and she says, why, I'd like to hear some. And I said, I was kind of surprised. And I said, well, why? And she says, well, I want to see what they're listening to and maybe I can relate to them more. And then as the music continued on, I mean, it was always a big factor in my life, um, she did show some of the other kids. And she, I remember one time she got into an explanation and she came back and wanted to hear some ACDC. <laughs> and uh, she would then explain to the children, you know, the metalheads and the grunge heads of the time that, uh, you know, this is nothing more than three bar blues, you know. And she would reference and tie together you know, and she explained to me that any given instrument can only make so many notes, it's how you arrange them. And then eventually one type of music becomes another and it feeds off of its other. Um, and uh, so she, we always had a great, great time with music with my mom. It's something I always will remember with her. And I only came up because my sister mentioned anthrax and I figured I'd let you guys know some more of the story. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Would anyone else care to share? Well, I'm John. I'm one of the dietaries at Independence Manor. Um, I know Glenna. I'd only met the, the two of the children. I had, the, I had a job as a dietary aide. Um, I bring her lunch to her room or to, her, to the table, and my favorite part of the time I said, Glenda, what do you want for dessert? She goes, well, John, I like chocolate ice cream with chocolate syrup. I said, okay. I come back. She's done. I said, Miss Glenda, you got to have more? She goes, give me another scoop. So I always, she always go, I like a lot of chocolate. So the serving cup was this big, so I always put an extra two or three on there for her. And I always remember her smile and everything. I loved her, like a, like a grandmother and a good friend. Thank you. Thanks. never know whose hearts you touch. Thanks, John. Would anyone else like to share? Yep. I kind of know we're not having one. Of course not. <laughs> I'm sorry. Brace yourselves. <laughs> no. No, I love my grandma. Yeah. Hi, I'm Christy. I'm uh, the second to youngest granddaughter, right? Grand, sure. Grand's child. And my grandma, like my mom said, we always had to, we visited my grandparents down in Florida at least once a year, my whole childhood. And recently I was on the phone with my grandma and uh, I, I told her like, you know, we used to go down and they lived on the water and they had a pool and it was like, it was like an oasis that we got to visit every year. And I told her how much I appreciated the opportunity to be able to do that. And she was so happy that she could provide that kind of upbringing for us. And um, I remember going down there and my mom would always make sure that we were like really well behaved. <laughs> and she's like, Grandma, like, you know, you don't put your elbows on the table at dinner. You know, you have to use fork and knife, no fingers on the, <laughs> you know. And, um, and we would always play Scrabble after dinner and eat chocolate ice cream. But they always had that Diet Dr. Pepper that was just garbage. But anyway. Um, <laughs> But as I got older, I started, uh, when we were eight, we kind of had a rite of passage where we would fly down by ourselves. And, um, and I liked going down to visit grandma by myself the most. And I, I did it as an adult a few times. And I think the first time as an adult that I went down by myself, I think I was 19. And nobody knew, but I was smoking cigarettes at the time. <laughs> and nobody knew, but grandma smoked cigarettes in the bathroom. <laughs> the whole oh, time no, <laughs> I, nobody knew though we so knew. I ran out of cigarettes and I had been there a few days and um and I said grandma by any chance and then 
crazy, crazy circumstance would you happen to have? Oh, also, I should back up. She, I knew where she stacked the cigarettes, and she had run out too. <laughs> so I went to her and I said, do you have a cigarette I could bum? And she said, no, of course not. I haven't smoked in 30 years. And I said, oh, me, I don't smoke either. And the next morning, she, she woke up really early and she woke me up and said, I'm going to the pharmacy, would you like to come with me? And I said, yes, I need pharmaceuticals. <laughs> and she went, she said, I'm gonna pick up a prescription in the back. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna stay in the front. And then I, I bought cigarettes really quick and then I, I said, I need something in the back. And she said, that's good, I need something in the front. And, and we never acknowledged it. Um, and then we got home and she went right to the bathroom where she always smoked and I went right to the dock. And, um, and we never discussed it until a few years later, I visited her condo in Florida. And it was the best visit I ever had with her. I only stayed for like 24 hours. I had a weekend off, you know, in college. And, and I, I went there and she was in her condo. Grandpa had passed. And um, her and I stayed up until 4 o'clock in the morning, two nights in a row, chain smoking on her balcony, chatting it up. And I just, I felt like I got to know her on a level that I never had gotten to before. And it was really amazing. And I'm really grateful for it. So thanks, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else? Okay. You insist? I insist. I do. The other sibling. I was going to say, the other brother I've heard so much about. Yes. Uh, well. You're going to regret this. <laughs> nope. Because I used to be a lawyer, so I'm long winded. <laughs> So in uh, about 1966, um, I was living in the Republic of Panama. I had this friend named Sean Young, who was a kid in the building next to me. I used to go over and see him. We lived in the Republic, but you know we were gringos living in the in the, in the Republic of Panama. So he had a friend, Ronnie Reznikov, who then I became friends with. And uh, but he was a year ahead of me, so. At that time, we didn't see each other too much. We moved to Miami, Florida, and uh, my parents divorced, and I ended up going back uh, to Panama with my father. And um, the, probably the first person I went to go see was Ronnie. I went over to, to the place, and, uh, and Glenna was there. And you know she heard the whole story about my parents, everything, and so she, she welcomed me. Uh, there in the house and um, you know we were living in a hotel so you know at first you know the uh, going down and room service and whatever we wanted and you know it was Panama so we could I used to sign up for cigarettes at, at the hotel but it was lonely and um, Ron and, and Glenna always welcomed me into their home. And uh, I just loved to hear you talking about sitting on the, on the uh, porch with your, on the balcony with your grandma because I don't know how many nights. They had this big, big, big apartment, huge apartment. And they had this big bedroom with a couch, you know, and a, like a little sitting area, little chairs and everything. And the, and they were both, you know, v highly intelligent and engaged people. And uh, I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't know how many nights we sat there and smoked. And I heard the stories about Canada and Queen's University and, you know, Ron outsmarting the colonel at Camp Cavite in the <laughs> Philippines and just, you know, I know you're not supposed to talk about smoking, but since you brought it up, that, those were the days, and we would sit up and talk for hours. And so, um, as a result of this connection, I, I got to have another family. And um, I mean, I got to meet Ron's parents in Miami Beach. I got to meet everyone's children, and now the grandchildren. And uh, 
Helena was not just a surrogate mother to me, she was my friend. And uh, she meant a lot to me. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here with the family to celebrate her. I'm going to ask the true middle child to come forward and share with us some of her thoughts. The triple middle. That's the first I've ever heard of it, actually. And it's, uh, you better explain to everybody what a triple middle is. There were five of us. I am in the middle of all five. I have two older siblings and two younger siblings. I am in the middle of the boys. First born, last born, boys, and the three girls in the middle. So I'm a triple middle child. <laughs> and my name's Linda. I've lost my mom, and now I'm lost. I'm just not me anymore. It's so very hard as she was such a huge part of my life. Not having her here is so very painful. I'm just not me anymore. Mom was so many things bundled up into a very small package. Kind yet firm, witty and sneaky, full of grace and elegance. So very, very caring, sharing and generous. She loved, she lived life. Growing up, she was everyone's mom. Even our friends would come and share their woes with her and seek her advice. And she was always there, always present. I've always said she deserved a medal for sainthood. She raised all of us and survived, and boy, did we give her a run for her money. I've lost my mom, and I'm not me anymore. The wind will carry her voice to me with the memories I hold near and dear. The rising sun will bring me her smiles, and I will feel the warmth of her embrace. The moonlight will bring me her sweet lullabies. The rain will wash my tears away so that her love may touch me in spirit each day, and her life will always be treasured in beautiful ways, allowing me to be me again. I love you, oodles and noodles, Mama. Miss you more. Thank you so much, Linda. I'm going to ask Juan to come forward and uh, read on behalf of his mom, Bonnie. I'd like to say a couple of words first, sure. too. Um, share my words first. Um, so, you know, I put a lot of thought into Grandma over the last few weeks, and uh, she's a large part of a lot of my core memories as a child. Um, when uh, I was, I guess, in preschool, even in uh, uh, being in parts of grade school, uh, usually two, three uh, days out of the week, I would spend the afternoons with her. And so I have a lot of fun memories just sitting around the butcher block countertop at regional and, uh, you know, just, you know, sort of BSing with whoever was there. Um, even as a young child, uh, she always treated me as an adult. Uh, I always did appreciate that. I think I got a lot of benefit out of it over the years. Um, and that relationship with grandma always stayed pretty strong. You know, there were times, obviously, with distance um, and, uh, you know, sort of the life decisions I did that took us, took me, you know, farther away from the family. But we always had great conversations when we, we got back together. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough, I guess, to have a bunch of time with her, um, you know, when grand grandpa had moved into the, into the home. Uh, work kind of brought me a little bit back into her life. And then I got to have my super fun smoke parties with Grandma. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Way before Grandpa died. Um, uh, yeah, we used to do uh, cigarettes and cigars and uh, just sit and talk. Uh, she was a great listener, M you know, one of the best. Always uh, was interested and uh, didn't really intrude with her advice, but always gave an interesting perspective. So, um, you know, I loved her very much. I'm going to miss her a ton, but. Um, my mom has prepared some words. Memories. Memories. Are you sure you don't want to read these, though, Mom? Okay. I'm going to caveat this, that these memories are in the first person, so they may sound a little bit odd coming from here, from me. But these are my mom's words, so just imagine that I am a much better person while I'm saying these. <laughs> 
I'm here today surrounded by the love of so many family and friends. I'm not ready to say goodbye yet. Time and time again, over the last few weeks, people have written and told me to hold on to all the memories of her life. What a range of emotions that has turned out to be. So let me share a few that come to mind. As a single child, mom often remarked how she didn't always understand us or our behavior. But she had Cleo, her lifelong friend, no matter where she was. I felt as if she was the sister she never had. I moved around so much as a child, I didn't know what it was like to grow up. Your whole life was such a close friend. We traveled a lot growing up, so friends were hard for me to make. Our immediate family were often also our friends. And yet over time, I have made friends, and so I'm thankful for them. Mom was all about caring for others and community service. Some of you have heard my story about my first experience with a soup kitchen in Mexico. It was our kitchen. A woman would come by every day to make our tortillas, and her son always offered to shine shoes. Mom asked if they wanted some soup, and they agreed. A few days later, she asked if her friend could join uh, and have some of the soup. She was hungry and had children to feed. Little by little, the word got out, and we always had a big pot of soup to provide a little help along the way. Then there were the girl, the girl guides and girl scouts. I'm actually not sure what a girl guide is, so you'll have to explain that one to me later. It's a Hispanic girl scout. It's okay. All right. Okay. Uh, beyond the traditional badge work, we did get to do some activities that might have been non-traditional. Like so many, we did camp, and boy, was that a challenge during the rainy season when about half of us would lose our tents in the rain. But we did have fun running hermit crab races on our mosquito nets over our cots. Our trips took us to the canal zone, uh, sorry, the canal zone locks, operation station, and we were able to open one of the locks. We also visited a leper colony. What an awareness builder. Kind of buried the lead on that one, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Mom was an English major, and so helping with homework always included her correcting our homework with a red pencil, a habit that I grew into when I got older, too. Mom encouraged my creative spirit. Who can forget the orange and avocado green paint job in the kitchen? <laughs> I didn't realize that one was you, but <laughs> solid. Later, we started a tradition, craft day, usually between Thanksgiving and the first week in December. Since those days, sisters, nieces, and others have created Christmas ornaments that we have treasured over the years. And while she did not think of herself as creative, she was so good at knitting and crocheting. We all have Christmas stockings, sweaters, afghans, mitts, socks, and scarves that she made over the years, often without a pattern. Mom loved Christmas or any event that included presents. She was just like a little kid and couldn't wait to open them up. She was a peeker <laughs> and would press her fingers through the paper to try to guess what was inside. We, a poker, a shaker? we once hid dresses inside the wrapping paper rolls to keep her from guessing what was inside. I wish I had the words to convey how I drew strength from her. I first connected with mom as an adult the week before I left for college and our relationship was strong from then on. Coffee or tea, you could always sit down and talk for hours with her. When I returned to Jersey, she was there to help me get back on my feet. She helped me with my resume, again with the red pencil. She introduced me to uh, what is now career and life transitions, took me to job interviews, and helped me terrorize the, the neighborhood after work as I relearned how to drive. She made room for Juan and I as she was back to a really full house. After I moved out, it was typical to stop Friday nights until the rush hour traffic die down and have a cup of coffee or more. Always wanting to know about your day and or any problems in your life, she was such a great listener and offered her advice. When I remarried, she always included Jim's mom, Rose, in our family holidays. I never had to choose where to go as we all ended up together. It was tough when mom and dad retired to Florida. During our visits, there was always coffee and conversation. When she returned 23 years later, we picked, up, we picked right up stopping after work and chatting away. COVID made it tough when we couldn't go in to see her, but we were later granted caregiver status and could see her for a couple of hours uh, for each visit. It was then that we got into the habit of going out to eat as she just wanted a change of scenery and she loved being around a table full of people. I've tried to live up to her expectations and I know that she was proud of what I had accomplished and are still accomplishing, not in the past tense, mom. I was happy to add game time with her and above all, beyond our chat time. I just wish I'd had more time, but don't we all? Just not ready to say goodbye, but I will hold all of my memories of her and her life was well lived. Thank you.
Thank you, Juan, and thank you to all of you for sharing the memories. And I would encourage all of you who are watching virtually, if you have a, a thought or a memory, uh, please, you know, just go to our website, to her page, and, and share that with the family. Um, it's the memories that remind us uh, where we came from, and it's the memories that encourage us to keep moving forward. Um, and it, I picked this quote because I thought it was your mom, and as I'm listening to you all tell the stories, I, I think she really inspired the, the truth to this. And it says, if you follow your heart and stay true to yourself, beautiful things will happen. Such a, a simple statement, but sometimes so hard for us to put into practice. But when we try, look at the beautiful things that occur. And yes, you are all the beautiful things. As we come to the conclusion of our time today, I must confess yet again I was having trouble on how to sum up um, this soul, how to encourage all of you um, to just push down the excess noise of life and just to go back to the simpler things that Glenna knew so well but that she put into practice. And then I went back to that Shel Silverstein quote, somewhere from a far off place, I hear you laughing and I smile. So I'm going to ask you um, to do some homework, and this is a nod to her teaching days at the almighty Voorhees <laughs> High School. Sorry for those who worked at North. Her daughter worked at North. So there's a rivalry for those of you not from town between Central and North and Voorhees and a couple of the high schools in town. But um, Glenna chose to work with youth who had um, difficulties in their life, behavior and otherwise. And um, she had students, and I'm digressing for a minute, but I think it's appropriate. She had students years later track her down mm -hmm. you remember yeah, to, sh to tell her the difference that she made in their lives and how they might have very well been in jail and or dead if it weren't for her intervening and her influence she is a mom she got it. She related. She didn't try to force her beliefs. And one, I'm so glad you said that because that's the way I always found her too. She listened and she gently gave her stuff in a thoughtful manner. It was never, it, well, maybe it was once in a while with you guys. <laughs> but to the rest of us, it was all that soft Glenna way that got her point across but encouraged you to find it for yourself. And that's a very powerful trait that not many people can do well. And she did it well. But these kids came back and, and she changed their lives. So you just never know. So the homework. The homework is simple. And I'm not foolish enough to, to not think you're all going to go out of this place and turn back on your cell phones and go back to life, right? The noise of life, death can only temper it for a moment. Um, but wherever you go tonight, let's just say the clock's changed. So let's say 9.30. It's dark at 9.30, probably wherever any of you are going to be. I want you to go out and I want you to look up at the stars. And I want you to hear these words uh, from the little prince. Yes, Jamie, we know you are the little prince in mom's world. <laughs> but 
this is homework that we all can do together. I want you to go and I want you to look up at the stars. I want you to find mom. We don't know which one she's going to be, but she's going to be there. Your dad's going to be there too. And your brother, Ronnie's going to be there as well. And we remember him today. As I know, he was probably one of the first people waiting to give mom that big hug uh, when she closed her eyes here and opened them in that place, again, where there's no pain or suffering but only light, peace, and hope. And I want you to look up at that star, and I want you to get whatever strength you need from it. And I want you to hear these words. All men have stars, but they're not the same things for different people. For some who are travelers, the stars are guides. For others, they are no more than little lights in the sky. For others who are scholars, they are problems. But all those stars, those stars are silent. You, you alone will have the stars as no one else has them. In one of the stars, I shall be living. In one of them, I will be laughing. And so it will be as if all the stars will be laughing when you look at the sky at night. You, only you, will have stars that can laugh. And when your sorrow is comforted, time soothes all sorrows, you will be content that you have known me. You will always be my friend. You will want to laugh with me. And you will sometimes open your windows so, for that pleasure, it will be as if, in place of the stars, I had given you a great number of little bells that knew how to laugh. Before our final words, I'm going to ask Linda to come forward one more time and share with us some music from her heart. And I'm also going to ask her to explain the instrument she's playing because it has a little story that I found quite beautiful and I think you will too. So this is a Native American flute and whenever I visited with mom or spoke with her on the phone the last thing I would always say to her was I love you oodles and noodles and her response to me would always be spaghetti. And I have lots of friends that make flutes. And he showed me this one, and he's like, I'm doing something different with my flutes now. What do you think? And he showed it to me, and I'm like, they look like grubs. He's like, look again. I'm like, maggots? <laughs> he's like, no, they're noodles. So I decided this is my noodle flute. It speaks to me. <laughs> and it does have what I think is a beautiful voice. Um, Native Americans will always tell you, you don't pick the flute, the flute picks you. So I think it found its home.
Thank you so much, Linda. You know, we spend a lot of time in this world um, encouraging uniqueness, which is a good thing. I could not play that flute as well as you just did. But I can give you a hug and say, well done. On the back it says, you're a piece of the puzzle of someone else's life. You never know where you fit, but others will fill the holes in their lives with pieces of you. We are part of one another, whether we want to be or not. Whether you're Canadian, whether you're Mexican, whether you speak French or Arabic, whether you're gay, straight, Jewish, Buddhist, it doesn't matter. We are all a part of one another, and Glenna knew it. She knew it better than anyone. And her passport to touch everybody else's hearts wasn't a, a United States passport, wasn't a Canadian passport. It was based on one simple and unique fact that we all have the ability to emulate. It was based on love. That's it. No big secret. Something easily shared. So as you take this puzzle piece, think about how Glenna still fits into your heart. How she still fits into your life. And how you do that for her still and for so many others. And think about how you honor her by being that source of strength, by being that source of love. May the blessed sunlight shine on you, Glenna, like a great peat fire, so that strangers and friends may come and warm themselves at it. And may light shine out of the two eyes of you, like a candle set in the window of a house, bidding the wanderer come in out of the storm. And may the blessing of the rain be on you always. May it beat upon your spirit and wash it fair and clean and leave there a shining pool where the blue of heaven shines and sometimes a star. And may the blessing of the earth always be on you, soft under your feet as you pass along the roads, soft under you as you lie out on it, tired at the end of day. And may it rest easy over you when at last you lie out under it. May it rest so lightly over you that your soul may be out from under it quickly, up and off on its way to eternity.